Okay, everybody, please have a seat. Okay, our final speaker of the day is James Finley from the University of Southern California. He's uh, on the biomechanics, neuromechanics side of things, uh, also works in rehabilitation. He's going to tell us about uh, some of the ways that people tend to cheat the system to try to get ahead when we do weird things like put them on split belt treadmills. Can everyone hear me in the back? Excellent. All right, so um, I'll try to finish up today with some work that I think is particularly interesting and I hope you guys find interesting too. Um, as the title suggests, um, we're doing some work looking at uh, mechanical work during split belt walking. And I think what's uh, two things that were interesting about this work, um, number one, this started uh, last year during dynamic walking, and I'll give a little bit of backstory as to what led to this project. And um, as you can see by the title slide, this is a collaboration between my lab at USC, um, as well as uh, Max Donlin's lab at uh, Simon Fraser. So the uh, secondary title for this talk, to sort of give you some context, is that uh, split belt treadmills are really just exoskeletons in disguise. So for those of you guys who don't study adapta split belt adaptation, there's something here uh, just for you. So um, for those of you who attended dynamic walking last year, you'll remember our um, lovely strolls to the, the center where we observed uh, and watched all, all the talks during the week. Um, so we heard a lot of talks just like we are today from exoskeletons to robotics to human physiology. We then ended that week um, at Andy's house where we had a beautiful scene um, next to a lake where we were people, an ocean. an ocean. Oh yes, I'm sorry, I should have known that. <laughs> so this is in Finland. And um, so while everyone was outside enjoying the, the beautiful scenery, Max and I, we're inside um, chatting away at a table. And this discussion actually got to the point where we literally had a napkin. And on that napkin, Max was drawing um, a sketch that really was about how we optimize energetic cost, right? So how is it that we, when we're exposed to these novel environments, whether they are devices or treadmills, how do we optimize energy? What are the, the, the factors that dictate whether or not we find energetically optimal strategies? And so since that time, uh, Max's lab and my group, we've been having a number of conversations about just this topic. And of course, this is really important um, to this crowd because for those of you who create powered devices, they essentially work on the principle that um, the human body can exploit what I'm going to call this uh, exogenous assistance, right? You're going to provide assistance to the body. Because of that assistance, the muscles perform less mechanical work, thereby reducing metabolic cost. Right? So very simple principle. Now, one key question is how do we learn to do this? So, and under what conditions can we really exploit this assistance? So um, there's a nice study by uh, Minoja's group a couple years ago that I really like, and it's a simulation study which basically asks the question of if you have an amputee, a below knee amputee, and you provide them with a powered ankle prosthesis, what's the best case scenario in terms of how you can potentially reduce metabolic costs? And so the main take home point here was that when you looked at the optimal strategy here as a function of essentially prosthetic uh, power, that you could get um, behaviors that were more or less energetically costly than what you might observe in a healthy, able-bodied participant. Okay? So this was a simulation study, and we can talk offline about um, some of the, the maybe challenges or limitations associated with that, but it's still a really interesting point. Whereas when you compare this to at least um, what I'm familiar with in terms of the state of the art from prosthesis, you can see that while in, with a powered prosthetic, while you can reduce metabolic cost, in this case in the blue from the red, which would be a, a passive device, to something that's closer to what you see in non-amputees, we still, at least to, to date, to my understanding, haven't achieved that sort of better than a healthy performance. So another key thing that I thought was really interesting about this, uh, stu this initial study was that this optimal strategy was an asymmetric gait. So um, for those of you who know that part of the big question that my lab tries to understand is how people adapt in the context of asymmetries and under what conditions symmetry versus asymmetric gates are, are optimal. So um, we typically do this in the context of looking at people adapt to a simple Burtag treadmill where we make one belt move faster than the other. Right? So um, we have a number of studies looking at this task. 
And the basic idea is that when you initially split the belts or make one move three times faster than the other, people walk with a limp. Okay? And so this actually looks a lot like someone who's had a stroke in terms of the, the, the kinematics. Whereas over time, people will adapt, to take, um, a, will adapt to take a gait that's much more symmetric. And particularly when we talk about symmetry here, we're talking about one form of symmetry, and that's taking steps of equal length. So people tend on the fast belt in black, they will gradually take steps that are longer, whereas on the slower belt, they gradually take steps that are shorter in order to equalize step lengths. Okay? Um, but of course, in order to have symmetry in this domain, we need to impose asymmetries in, in another domain, and namely timing. So one question is how do people actually achieve uh, these this, this symmetric step lengths? Now, if you think about step length, it's just the distance between the feet as you step on the ground, and that can be affected both by where you place the leading foot as well as how far your trailing leg is uh, behind the body. So uh, in terms of what people, how people uh, adapt their step lengths, one of the major ways they do that is by placing the leg on the fast belt. So the right side of this figure would be the fast belt. So you learn to step further forward in front of the body on the fast belt. And um, in another study, we've quantified how much this foot placement strategy actually contributes to overall changes in asymmetry here. And what you can basically see is that if we take what we call this position contribution that's related to where the feet are placed in front of the body, you see that over time as people are adapting, you see a gradual increase in this position contribution to counteract the asymmetry imposed by the treadmill. And as you go to, from a two to one to a three to one speed ratio, this is the dominant strategy that people tend to change. So as this asymmetry between belt speeds becomes larger, people tend to take much larger steps on the fast belt. So um, a, a critical question that we want to understand is why might people do this? What is the advantage of stepping further forward on the fast belt? So uh, last year, uh, Brian Selgrade and, and, and from Yunki Chang's group uh, published a nice study where they began to look at some of the mechanical energetics of uh, split belt walking. And so, um, like most of what I'll show for the rest of the slide, this study is going to be considering the body as a point mass and computing measures of leg mechanical uh, power or work. So if you take this figure from their paper, um, the two uh, traces that I'd like you to focus on are the solid black line and the solid red line because they represent what's happening on the fast belt. So during what we would call the early adaptation phase here in the black, you see that there is a small amount of negative work done by the fast leg, but a much larger um, amount of positive work done on the fast belt. But what you learn to do over the course of adaptation is dramatically increase this negative work done on the fast belt. Okay. So now if we look across limbs and look at the uh, work per performed across a full stride, you see that there's this bias toward positive work when the belts are initially split and a gradual decay. And that decay is associated primarily with, again, changes in the fast leg, um, producing less positive mechanical work during adaptation. So one of the, uh, one of the things that we thought was interesting as, as Max and I were discussing this issue is really the, trying to understand what are, what are the differences, number one, between treadmill and overground walking? And then number two, how is split belt walking special? Right? Is there something special about this asymmetry that you can actually exploit? So um, if we think about, again, this idealized point mass system, we have the legs providing, um, generating some force on the center of mass. We can then consider the leg system that is uh, where, again, there's the force, the reaction force from the center of mass and the force from the ground. So of course, when you're walking over ground, the point of force application on the ground does not move. So the leg power is the dot product of the uh, force generated by the ground reaction force and the velocity of your center of mass. Now, when walking on a treadmill, you get um, initially a similar story, but the key thing here is that now the um, point of application of force at the, the foot or the surface is now moving because of the, the treadmill belts. And so now we have this situation where the legs can perform work on the center of mass as well as on the individual belts. And so um, Max's group has put together a, a couple of uh, videos to sort of illustrate what we mean here. So the first is just to consider a completely passive body. 
um, actually a two by four. Um, and this is just a simple illustration of the belt performing positive work on the two by four, right? The, the um, piece of wood is placed on the treadmill. You see an increase in the potential energy as well as kinetic energy due to the work performed by the belts. Do we have sound here? No. There we go. All right. So this is Max performing negative work on the belts. So you can hear this uh, cyclic increase in essentially the current to the motors as Max is pushing against the belt. Right? So that's now the belt, because the, the, the treadmill is controlled to maintain a steady velocity, the motor is now injecting more current to, to maintain that velocity. And then, of course, the last case is what the body that we can perform positive work on the belt simply by pushing in the same uh, direction as the belt is moving. So the central question here is can we exploit this asymmetry in work performed both by the belts and the legs to actually improve economy? So we'll illustrate how you might be able to do that. So during the early adaptation phase, Typically what we see is that the leg on the fast belt is primarily performing a lot of positive work. So we, we illustrated that a few slides back. Now, the net force on the center of mass across a full stride should, uh, should sum to, to zero so that the body is, no, is not translating in space. So we have this net positive force on the fast belt that must be balanced by a net uh, negative force on the slow belt. And that's illustrated here. So given that the slow belt is moving much slower than the fast belt, even though we have a net zero force on the body, we actually have much more positive work done by both legs than uh, negative work. So we have this bias toward positive work. Now, what you can do to exploit this asymmetry during late adaptation is now I can switch to performing a lot of negative work with the leg on the fast belt to take advantage of the fact that it's moving faster. Right? And so now we have this net negative force on the body across the uh, fast stance phase. And this needs, again needs to be uh, balanced by the slow belt. But again, because this belt is moving more slowly than the fast belt, you get now this uh, shift towards net negative work um, being greater than net positive work. Can I, can I just ask yes. So this, uh, the, the lab coordinates, so in the gl a global, global velocity. Okay, uh, Andy might have something to say about that. Uh, I guess what I would say is each, each belt I would just want to treat as its own inertial reference frame. Okay. And so when I have a leg sticking on that, I think I just want the force times the velocity of the center mass as measured from that belt's reference frame. Mm-hmm. In what sense? Can I comment on that? Uh, I, this is just this really pedagogical. Do I have to do something? Do I have to do something? I don't know. Just go ahead. If you're going to do an energy calculation, you have to pick an inertial reference frame and you have to stick to that same inertial reference frame for every single term and every single equation. So you cannot, you cannot say oh, each belt should be its own inertial reference frame because it's, there's the, all, the, all energy calculations depend on, on using just a single reference frame. So this thing about Galilean invariance applies to forces and acceleration, does not apply to energy. So you, you, ha you have to, it's, so it sounds like you're sort of suggesting something kind of wrong to me. You have to pick right. a reference frame. So you pick a lab reference frame, pick one belt, pick the other belt, uh, but you, you, that's what you got to do. Is that address what you're saying? Okay. All right. So hopefully everything is clear so far. So we'll try to speed through the rest here. All right, so, um, so based on what I've covered here, we have a few different observations and some predictions that we'll test experimentally. So the first is that we've shown that adaptation involves this gradually, gradual increase in forward foot placement and approximately equal step lengths. Um, from Yonke's work, this has been shown that this, the, there's a gradual uh, reduction in the positive work performed by the legs. And then we've shown previously that there's a uh, simultaneous reduction in metabolic cost. 
So what we are predicting is that positive step length asymmetries, where now instead of taking steps of equal length, you step even further forward on the fast belt, should result in net negative work performed by the limbs. And so now, if net negative work is performed, um, this obviously needs to be offset by positive work performed on the body by the belts. And given this bias toward negative work, we're predicting that we should be able to see reductions in metabolic cost beyond what might typically be observed when taking steps of equal length, okay? So this is, in other words, the body should be able to take advantage of the work performed by the treadmill. And so um, what we did to test this, this prediction was we took um, an experimental paradigm that we've, we've published recently where we have people walking on our treadmill. We're using visual feedback to modulate their individual step lengths. We can then map a range of asymmetries by varying the length of each step. So in this case, negative values represent a longer step on the slow belt, whereas positive values represent longer steps on the fast belt. Okay? So we measured mechanical work as well as metabolic power over the course of uh, th this experiment. So just skip ahead here. So the first result that we found, so we're going to look at work rate, and all of our uh, measures are non-dimensionalized. Non uh, work rate is non-dimensionalized by a combination of mass, gravity, and leg length. So when you look at, uh, as people vary their asymmetry from negative values to positive values, again, where they're taking longer steps on the fast belt, what you, what you observe is this, this is group data from 10 participants, where we see a reduction both in positive work performed as well as an increase in negative work. Okay? So this is consistent with the prediction that we, that we made previously. So this, there's this, again, a reduction in net positive work as well as an increase in net negative work. And so now the legs are performing net negative work at these positive asymmetries, which we typically don't um, observe during our experiments. If we now look at the work performed by the treadmill on the body, we can see that, again, as asymmetry becomes positive, now the treadmill switches from doing negative work um, on the body to now doing more positive work on the, on the body. Okay. Switch, what's, what's the x -axis? Sorry, the x-axis here is a measure of step length asymmetry, so it's a, basically a normalized difference in step lengths. But the key thing to consider is that positive values means the step on the fast belt is longer, and negative values mean the, mean the step on the slow belt is longer. Okay. Is that clear? Okay, <laughs> all right. Any other questions so far? Okay. When you, mm -hmm. when you say the net work rate on the body, is that exactly the net negative of the net work rate on the belt? Yes. Okay. Is there a follow-up? No, maybe easier to think about, are the belts doing work, period? Just let them work on the belts. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think we could, re we could represent it the same way. It might be simpler that way. Um, all right. Yes? So, you're, uh, I think the question was, if we have equal step lengths, but the foot placement is different, then what's the, what's the follow-up from that? So in, in this metric of step length asymmetry, it would be symmetric because we're looking sp um, specifically at step lengths. But we haven't tried to de decouple whether or not the foot placement uh, differs across legs and so on. Okay, okay. so again, uh, we're just showing that this bias towards a negative um, network done by the legs at these positive asymmetries. So now the question is, how does this change in behavior relate to metabolic cost? So if we um, take an example set of data, this is just data from one participant, where we're now showing metabolic power is on the x-axis, and then our work rate is on the y-axis. So just to sort of um, configure you to the layout of this figure, here on the left-hand side, where metabolic power is lowest, this again would be, correspond to our positive asymmetry, so longer step on the fast belt. Whereas on the other end, when we have our highest metabolic cost, this re relates to this uh, negative asymmetry. So now when we look at the data set for all participants, what we, can, what we see 
is that there's a reduction, excuse me, as the uh, positive leg work here is decreased, we see a simultaneous reduction in metabolic power. So if you look at the slope of this line, um, for approximately every unit of work performed by the legs, positive work, excuse me, we see an increase in metabolic power of about uh, 13%. And so the uh, one interesting thing here is that the slope of this line is actually in the same ballpark as estimates of uh, the efficiency of positive work, both for um, walking up inclines as well as uh, measures of uh, positive work during step-to-step, -step, excuse me, work during step-to-step -step transitions. So the main point here is that it seems to, there seems to be a metabolic benefit of taking positive um, asymmetries, which we rarely observe during experiments. So the question is, now that we've given people um, a time to explore this landscape, are they actually now going to exploit um, this asymmetry? So if we take all of our metabolic cost data, and now we look at metabolic power uh, versus asymmetry, what we see is this general negative slope. So in other words, for positive asymmetries, again, we see that there's a reduction in metabolic cost. So the prediction would be that if people are aware of this relationship, and we allow them to freely select how they will walk on the treadmill, that they should choose positive asymmetries. And so we did just that. So we had a, a final trial in the experiment where we removed the visual feedback and allowed people to adopt whatever it was that they, they selected. And so here's what we, what we saw here. So again, typically during these experiments, when you allow people to freely adapt, they tend to plateau at slightly negative asymmetries or sometimes zero. But what we're observing here is that now we're actually getting people to be biased towards more positive asymmetries, which are almost never ex um, observed during experiments. And so what this actually hints at is that by giving people experience throughout the full cost landscape, they may have some sense of what is more energetically optimal and then bias their behavior towards that, uh, that energetically optimal strategy. All right. So, um, to conclude here, what we think is really interesting here that uh, I think relates to a lot of the work being done by this group is that uh, the split belt treadmill presents this interesting opportunity where people can actually exploit the asymmetry and the work performed by the belts and they can choose where they can do positive versus negative work. And by choose, I mean, excuse me, by where, I mean look, doing work more on the fast belt versus the slow belt. So by doing more, by stepping further forward on the fast belt, we can reduce the net positive work performed by the legs and simultaneously the, um, increase the net negative work performed and ultimately reduce metabolic cost. Okay. So um, to kind of finish up here, what we really think that this sh shows is that we can use split belt adaptation as a way to understand how people adapt to assistance, um, exogenous ex assistance provided by a device, and that this has, um, you know, I think really important parallels to what a lot of work that we're doing, looking at exoskeletons and assistive uh, devices. So I'll conclude there. Thank you. Okay, there's a question back over here, and we have, we have about seven and a half minutes for questions, so it should be a good conversation. Um, am I correct in understanding that there seems to be like a dir direct, almost linear relationship between this positive step length asymmetry and reduction in metabolic cost? Is that a correct? Um, so are you referring to this? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. So is that, is that true? Yes, so this, this is just, this is what the data tell us. Okay, yeah. so in that case, there, it's not like people that are adapting with this, with the symmetry in treadmill walking, like what you saw at first, it's not like they're stuck in a local minimum uh, or energetic minimum. It's like if they continued down this gradient, they would eventually hit this new minimum, right? So why is it that you think people get stuck in this symmetrical gait? Yeah, so I mean, that, that's an excellent question. So if the data for each person are exactly linear as you see here, then there should be a pretty steep gradient uh, that driving people to positive asymmetries. So um, I think there are multiple possibilities here. So, so one is that maybe for each individual person, um, when you're looking at adaptation in the absence of visual feedback, 
that there may be some differences in that gradient, right? So this is a natural behavior versus one that's guided by vision. Um, another possibility is that there are, of course, other factors that might uh, lead people to choose asymmetries, excuse me, um, to walk with more symmetric patterns. So one thing that you notice, and I think I, I, think I showed this already uh, here. So an interesting thing that happens at uh, an asymmetry of zero is that now you basically um, have a net work rate by the legs of approximately zero. So that's shown here. So that's just an interesting observation. We don't know that it's, uh, we're not sort of proposing that this is what people are optimizing, but there could be other things that are um, appealing about taking steps of, of equal length in this environment. Yes. Yes. So why people don't originally uh, deviate from the symmetrical gait pattern. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if um, just pushing people to get out of a natural gait pattern of symmetry could also do this. So if you had participants walk in a circle so that the step lengths of the outside leg were also, so you were pushing people out of this normal symmetrical gait pattern, whether they would still see this long-term adaptation to a more um, positive metabolic uh, efficiency. Okay. Adaptation. So um, maybe to rephrase the question, are you asking if we were to prime people such that they came into the adaptation environment and had a, a, an asymmetric bias, would they go back to symmetry or that asymmetric strategy? So the, um, the study I don't believe has been done in healthy participants, but if you take someone who's had a stroke who has a naturally asymmetric gait and you have them adapt in a similar way, they will go back to their baseline, which is asymmetric. So it does seem to be, at least in, those, in the healthy um, case and the post-stroke case, that people go back to their natural baseline. Okay. Uh, we have one here in the back. So, um, so people find this new, op new uh, low metabolic energy cost as, after they adapt. How does that energy cost compare to the symmetric case? It's still higher than the symmetric case, right? So um, it's actually, so when we allow them to freely adapt without visual feedback, so they, they so I'll, I'll restate the question. The question was when we um, allow people to adopt this positive asymmetry, when they freely adapt, is that metabolic cost different from what would be observed during symmetry, is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so yes it is. There, there are two potential reasons why that may, might be the case. The first is that when they're freely adapting, again, there's no visual feedback. So there's, there is likely to be a difference in metabolic cost because we know that just walking with visual feedback leads to an increase in metabolic cost. Um, but what we saw is that when we compare the, the, the asymmetry at which they plateaued, so that positive asymmetry, to the best case measured in the visual feedback condition, there was on average about a 5% reduction in metabolic cost in the freely selected case. So, it's, so we're still trying to understand what, what that means. If they found something that's optimal in the condition with there's no, when there's no visual feedback um, is, is one possibility. Yes. Yeah. So for the asthmatic read, uh, for the different asthmatic read, uh, did the subject maintain the uh, same like body speed or they have different body speed? So you're asking for the different asymmetries, are they walking at different speeds? Yeah. No, so they're stationary on the tread, on average they're stationary on the treadmill in all cases. So there's, they're not drifting backward or forward in, um, in either asymmetry condition. Uh, oh, I see what you're, so, you, and then this gets to the inertial reference frame question, I believe. So now um, you're asking, so for instance, you could, if you spend more time on the fast or the slow belt than the fast belt, then on average you might be going slower than the average belt speed. Is that? Yeah, I think, I think it depends, uh, you know, if we're, if we're looking at a lab reference frame, no. Right? But if you're trying to compute the speed relative to the belts, then that gets a little bit uh, trickier, particularly because during double support it's not defined. 
Um, so I don't have a, a sense for how, how you would sort of define that, that speed relative to the belts. Yeah. I'm trying to process your statement that some, that these experiments are similar to the uh, exoskeleton experiments. In particular, with the exoskeleton experiments, we uh, were, are able to sort of customize assistance to the subjects. And uh, in trying to make sense of those experiments, one of the thing, one of the possible hypotheses as to why the exoskeleton experiments work is what I call the sort of jerk the subject around hypothesis, okay. where jerking the subject around facilitates motor learning. The evidence for that is when we first tried to do the exoskeleton ass assistance thing with sort of very gentle optimization algorithms, we didn't get very good results. Okay. But when we started doing really aggressive jerk the subject around, we got fantastic results. How would you do the same sort of experiment in your setup? So um, my interpretation, so the question is, um, or the point is that with exoskeleton studies, one reason why people may tend to adopt more optimal strategies is because they're um, sort of jerked around, which I will describe as ex exploration. Right? Would, you, would you be happy with that, that you're actually forcing them to explore? Okay, so I would say that that is in some sense similar to what we're showing here. So by forcing people to walk at different asymmetries, we're forcing them to explore that, that landscape. Okay. And so because they've now explored the landscape, they tend towards positive asymmetries when we allow them to freely adapt. When we don't force that exploration, they tend to, they tend to plateau at negative asymmetries. So I think the point here is that it is similar in the sense that when we give them this, this when we force them to explore, the solution that they um, settle upon is not the same as what they would naturally do. Okay, so uh, with that, we have to cut it off for uh, the moment, but don't get up and leave yet. Jerry has several important announcements. And thank you, James. Okay, so some quick things here. I'll try to go really quick. Um, the vegan gluten.